Chapter 6. Why populism is sometimes good enough in practice, but not good enough in theory. Gerald Fitzgerald, the Irish ex-Prime Minister, once formulated a proper Hegelian reversal of the commonplace wisdom, this may be good for theory, but it is not good enough for practice. This may be good in practice, but it is not good enough in theory. This reversal best encapsulates the ambiguous position of populist politics. While it can sometimes be endorsed as part of a short-term pragmatic compromise, one should critically reject the notion in its fundamental dimension. The positive dimension of populism is its potential suspension of democratic rules. Democracy, in the way this term is used today, concerns, above all, formal legalism. Its minimal definition is unconditional adherence to a certain set of formal rules, which guarantee that antagonisms are fully absorbed into the agonistic game. Democracy means that whatever electoral manipulation took place, every political agent will unconditionally respect the result. In this sense, the US presidential elections of 2000 were effectively democratic in spite of obvious electoral manipulation and of the patent meaninglessness of the fact that a couple hundred Florida voices decided who would be the president. The Democratic candidate accepted his defeat. In the weeks of uncertainty after the elections, Bill Clinton made an appropriate acerbic comment. The American people have spoken. We just don't know what they said. This comment should be taken more seriously than it was meant. Even now we do not know it, and maybe because there was no substantial message behind the result at all. Jacqueline Miller has shown how democracy implies the barred big other. However, the Florida example demonstrates that, nonetheless, there is a big other, which continues to exist in democracy, the procedural big other of electoral rules, which should be obeyed whatever the result. And it is this big other, this unconditional reliance on rules, that populism threatens to suspend. Which is why there is in populism always something violent, threatening, for the liberal view. An open or latent pressure, a warning that if elections are manipulated, the will of the people will have to find another way to impose itself. Even if electoral legitimization of power is respected, it is made clear that elections play a secondary role, that they serve only to confirm a political process whose substantial weight lies elsewhere. This is why the regime of Hugo Chavez in Venezuela is genuinely populist. Although it was legitimized by elections, it is clear that its exercise of power relies on a different dynamic. Direct organization of the poor in favelas and other modes of local self-organization. This is what gives the thrill to populist regimes. The democratic rules are never fully endorsed. There is always an uncertainty that pertains to them. A possibility always looms that they will be redefined, unfairly changed in the middle of the game. This aspect of populism should be fully endorsed. The problem is not its undemocratic character, but its reliance on a substantial notion of the people. In populism, the big other, although potentially suspended in the guise of procedural formalism, returns in the guise of the people as the substantial agent legitimizing power. There are thus two elementary and irreducible sides to democracy, the violent egalitarian rise of the logic of those who are supernumerary, the part of no part, those who, while formally included within the social edifice, have no determinate place within it, and the regulated, more or less, universal procedure of choosing those who will exert power. How do these two sides relate to each other? What if democracy, in the second sense, the regulated procedure of registering the people's voice, is ultimately a defense against itself, against democracy in the sense of the violent intrusion of the egalitarian logic that disturbs the hierarchical functioning of the social edifice, an attempt to re-functionalize this excess, to make it a part of the normal running of the social edifice. However, the trap to be avoided here is to oppose these two poles as the good versus the bad. That is, to dismiss institutionalized democratic procedure as an ossification of a primordial democratic experience. 
What truly matters is precisely the degree to which the democratic explosion succeeds in becoming institutionalized, translated into social order. Not only are democratic explosions easily recuperated by those in power, since the day after, people awaken to the sober reality of power relations, reinvigorated by fresh democratic blood, which is why those in power love explosions of creativity, like the French May 1968. Often, the ossified democratic procedure to which the majority continues to stick as to the dead letter is the only defence remaining against the onslaught of totalitarian passions of the crowd. The problem is thus, how to regulate, institutionalise, the very violent egalitarian democratic impulse, how to prevent it being drowned in democracy in the second sense of the term, regulated procedure. If there is no way to do it, then authentic democracy remains a momentary utopian outburst which, on the proverbial morning after, has to be normalised. The harsh consequence to be accepted here is that this excess of egalitarian democracy over the democratic procedure can only institutionalise itself in the guise of its opposite, as revolutionary democratic terror. Good enough in practice. The 2005 French and Dutch no's to the project of the European Constitution were clear-cut cases of what, in French theory, is referred to as a floating signifier, a no of confused, inconsistent, overdetermined meanings, a kind of container in which the defense of workers' rights coexists with racism, in which the blind reaction to a perceived threat and fear of change coexist with vague utopian hopes. We are told that the French no was really a no to many other things, to Anglo-Saxon neoliberalism, to Chirac and his government, to the influx of immigrant workers from Poland who lower the wages of the French workers, and so on and so forth. The real struggle is going on now, namely the struggle for the meaning of this no. Who will appropriate it? Who, if anyone, will translate it into a coherent alternative political vision? If there is a predominant reading of the no, it is a new variation on the old Clinton motto, it's the economy, stupid. The no was supposedly a reaction to Europe's economic lethargy, falling behind with regard to other newly emerging blocks of economic power. It's economic, social, and ideological-political inertia. But, paradoxically, an inappropriate reaction, a reaction on behalf of this very inertia of privileged Europeans, of those who want to cling on to old welfare state privileges. It was the reaction of old Europe, triggered by the fear of any real change, the refusal of the uncertainties of the brave new world of globalist modernization. No wonder that the reaction of official Europe was one of near panic at the dangerous, irrational, racist and isolationist passions that sustained the no, at a parochial rejection of openness and liberal multiculturalism. One is used to hearing complaints about the growing apathy of the voters, about the decline of popular participation in politics. So worried liberals talk all the time about the need to mobilise people in the guise of civil society initiatives, to engage them more in a political process. However, when the people awaken from their apolitical slumber, it is a rule in the guise of a rightist populist revolt. No wonder many enlightened technocratic liberals now wonder whether the previous form of apathy was not a blessing in disguise. One should be attentive here to how even those elements which appear as pure rightist racism are in fact a displaced version of working-class protest. Of course, there is a form of racism in demanding an end to the immigration of foreign workers who pose a threat to employment. However, one should bear in mind the simple fact that the influx of immigrant workers from the post-communist countries is not the consequence of multiculturalist tolerance. It is indeed part of the strategy of capital to hold in check workers' demands. This is why, in the US, Bush did more for the legalization of the status of Mexican illegal immigrants than did the Democrats, caught up by labor union pressures. So, ironically, rightist racist populism is today the best argument 
that the class struggle, far from being obsolete, goes on. The lesson the left should learn from it is that one should not commit the error, symmetrical to that of the populist racist mystification, displacement of hatred onto foreigners, and to throw the baby out with the bathwater, that is, to merely oppose populist anti-immigration racism with multiculturalist openness, obliterating its displaced class content. Benevolent as it wants to be, the simple insistence on tolerance is the most perfidious form of anti-proletarian class struggle. Typical here is the reaction of German mainstream politicians to the formation of the new Linkspartei in the 2005 elections, a coalition of the East German PDS and leftist dissidents of the SPD. Joschka Fischer himself reached one of the lowest points in his career when he called Oscar Lafontaine a German hider because Lafontaine protested at the importation of cheap East European labour to lower the wages of German workers. The exaggerated and panicky way the political and even cultural establishment reacted when Lafontaine referred to foreign workers, or when the secretary of the SPD called the financial speculators locusts, is symptomatic, as if we were witnessing a full neo-Nazi revival. This total political blindness, this loss of the very capacity to distinguish left from right, betrays a panic at politicization as such. The automatic dismissal of entertaining any thoughts outside the established post-political coordinates as populist demagoguery is the hitherto purest proof that we effectively live under a new Denkverbot. It is not only that today's political field is polarized between post-political administration and populist politicization. Phenomena such as Berlusconi demonstrate how the two opposites can even coexist in the same party. Is the Berlusconi movement Forza Italia not a case of post-political populism? That is, of a mediatic administrative government legitimizing itself in populist terms. And does the same not hold to some degree even for the new Labour government in the UK, or for the Bush administration in the US? In other words, is populism not progressively replacing multiculturalist tolerance, as the spontaneous ideological supplement to post-political administration, as its pseudo-concretization, its translation into a form that can appeal to individuals' immediate experience. The key fact here is that pure post-politics, a regime whose self-legitimization would be thoroughly technocratic, presenting itself as a competent administration, is inherently impossible. Any political regime needs a supplementary populist level of self-legitimization. This is why today's populism is different from the traditional version. What distinguishes it is the opponent against which it mobilizes the people. The rise of post-politics, the growing reduction of politics proper to the rational administration of conflicting interests. In the highly developed countries of the US and Western Europe, at least, populism is emerging as the inherent shadowy double of institutionalized post-politics. One is almost tempted to say, as its supplement, in the Derridian sense, as the arena in which political demands that do not fit the institutionalized space can be articulated. In this sense, there is a constitutive mystification that pertains to populism. Its basic gesture is to refuse to confront the complexity of the situation, to reduce it to a clear struggle with a pseudo-concrete enemy figure, from the Brussels bureaucracy to illegal immigrants. Populism is thus, by definition, a negative phenomenon, a phenomenon grounded in a refusal, even an implicit admission of impotence. We all know the old joke about a man looking for the key he has dropped under the streetlight. When asked where he lost it, he admits that it was in an ill-lit spot, so why is he looking for it here, under the light? Because the visibility is so much better here. There was always something of this trick in populism. So not only is populism not the arena within which today's emancipatory projects should inscribe themselves, but one should even go a step further and propose that the main task of contemporary emancipatory politics, its life and death problem, is to find a form of political mobilization that, while like populism, critical of institutionalized politics, will avoid the populist temptation. 
Where then does all this leave us with regard to Europe's imbroglio? The French voters were not given a clear, symmetrical choice, since the very terms of the choice privileged the yes. The elite proposed a choice to the people which was, in fact, no choice at all. People were called to ratify the inevitable, the result of enlightened expertise. The media and the political elite presented the choice as the one between knowledge and ignorance, between expertise and ideology, between post-political administration and the archaic political passions of the left and the right. The no was thus dismissed as a short-sighted reaction, unaware of its own consequences, a murky reaction of fear of the emerging new post-industrial global order, a conservative instinct to protect creaking welfare state structures, a gesture of refusal lacking any positive alternative program. No matter that the only political parties whose official stance was no were the parties at the opposite extremes of the political spectrum. Le Pen's Front National on the right and the Communists and Trotskyists on the left. However, even if there is an element of truth in all this, the very fact that the no was not sustained by a coherent alternative political vision is the strongest possible condemnation of the political and mediatic elite, a monument to their inability to articulate, to translate into a political vision, the people's longings and dissatisfactions. Indeed, in their reaction to the no, they treated the people as retarded pupils who had not learnt the lesson of the experts. Their self-criticism was the one of the teacher who admits that he failed to educate his students properly. What the advocates of this communication thesis, the French and Dutch know, means that the enlightened elite had failed to communicate adequately with the masses, failed to see, is that, on the contrary, the knowing question was a perfect example of communication in which, as Lacan put it, the speaker gets from the addressee its own message, in its inverted, that is, true form. The enlightened European bureaucrats received from the electorate the shallowness of their own message to them in its true form. The project of European Union that was rejected by France and the Netherlands stood for a kind of cheap trick, as if Europe could redeem itself and beat its competitors by simply combining the best of both worlds, by beating the US, China and Japan in scientific technological modernization through keeping alive its cultural traditions. One should insist here that, if Europe is to redeem itself, it should, on the contrary, be ready to take the risk of losing, in the sense of radically questioning, both dispelling the fetish of scientific technological progress and stop relying on the superiority of its cultural heritage. So although the choice was not between two political options, it was also not the choice between the enlightened vision of a modern Europe, ready to fit into the new global order, and old, confused political passions. When commentators described the no as a message of bewilderment and fear, they were wrong. The main fear at issue here is the fear the no itself provoked in the new European elite, the fear that the people would no longer swallow their post-political vision. For the rest of us, the no is a message and expression of hope, hope that politics is still alive and possible, that the debate about what the new Europe shall and should be is still wide open. This is why we, on the left, should reject the sneering insinuation by liberals that, in our no, we find ourselves with strange neo-fascist bedfellows. What the new populist right and the left share is just one thing. The awareness that politics proper is still alive. There was a positive choice in the no. The choice of the choice itself. The rejection of the blackmail by the new elite, which offers us only the choice to confirm their expert knowledge, or to display one's irrational immaturity. The no is the positive decision to start a real political debate about what kind of Europe we really want. Late in his life, Freud asked the famous question, Was will das Wieb? What does the woman want? Admitting his perplexity when faced with the enigma of feminine sexuality, 
does the imbroglio with the European constitution not bear witness to the same puzzlement? What kind of Europe do we want? The unofficial anthem of the European Union, heard at numerous political, cultural and sporting public events, is the Ode to Joy, from the last movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, a true empty signifier that can stand for anything. In France, it was elevated by Romain Rolland into a humanist ode to the brotherhood of all peoples, the Marseillaise of humanity. In 1938, it was performed as the high point of Reichsmusiktage, and later for Hitler's birthday. In the China of the Cultural Revolution, in the febrile context of a mass rejection of European classics, it was redeemed as a piece of progressive class struggle, while in contemporary Japan, it has achieved a cult status, being woven into the very social fabric with its supposed message of joy through suffering. Until the 1970s, that is, during the period when both West and East German Olympic teams had to perform together as one German team, the anthem played for German gold medalists was the Ode. And simultaneously, the Rhodesian white supremacist regime of Ian Smith, which proclaimed independence in the late 1960s in order to maintain apartheid, also appropriated the same song as its national anthem. Even Abimael Guzman, the now imprisoned leader of Sendero Luminoso, when asked what music he loved, mentioned the fourth movement of Beethoven's Ninth. So it is easy to picture an imaginary performance at which all the sworn enemies, from Hitler to Stalin, from Bush to Saddam, forget their differences and participate in the same magic moment of ecstatic brotherhood. However, before we dismiss the fourth movement as a piece destroyed through social usage, let us note some peculiarities of its structure. In the middle of the movement, after we hear the main melody, the joy theme, in three orchestral and three vocal variations, at this first climax, something unexpected happens which has bothered critics over the last 180 years, ever since the first performance. At bar 331, the tone changes totally, and instead of the solemn hymnic progression, the same joy theme is repeated in Marcia Turca, Turkish march style, borrowed from the military music for wind and percussion instruments that 18th century European armies had adopted from the Turkish janissaries. The mode is here that of a carnivalesque popular parade, a mocking spectacle. And after this point, everything goes wrong. The simple solemn dignity of the first part of the movement is never recovered. After this Turkish part, and in a clear counter-movement to it, in a kind of retreat into inner religiosity, the choral-like music, dismissed by some critics as a Gregorian fossil, tries to depict the ethereal image of millions of people who kneel down embracing one another, contemplating the distant sky in awe and searching for the loving paternal God who must dwell above the canopy of stars. Uberm sternezelt muss ein lieber Wetterhornen. However, the music, as it were, gets stuck when the word mus, first rendered by the basses, is repeated by the tenors and altos, and finally by the sopranos, as if this repeated conjuration is a desperate attempt to convince us, and itself, of what it knows is not true, turning the line, a loving father must dwell, into a desperate act of beseechment, and thus attesting to the fact that there is nothing beyond the canopy of stars, no loving father to protect us and to guarantee our brotherhood. After this, a return to a more celebratory mood is attempted in the guise of the double fugue, which cannot but sound false in its excessively artificial brilliance. A fake synthesis, if there ever was one. A desperate attempt to cover up the void of the absent God revealed in the previous section. But the final candentha is the strangest of them all, sounding less like Beethoven than a puffed-up version of the finale of Mozart's Abduction from Seraglio, combining the Turkish elements with the fast Rococo spectacle. And let us not forget the principal lesson of this Mozart opera. The figure of the Oriental despot is presented there as a true enlightened master. 
The finale is thus a bizarre mixture of Orientalism and regression into late 18th century classicism, a double retreat from the historical present, a silent admission of the purely phantasmatic character of the joy of all-encompassing brotherhood. If there ever was a music that literally deconstructs itself, this is it. The contrast between the highly ordered linear progression of the first part of the movement and the precipitous, heterogeneous and inconsistent character of the second cannot be stronger. No wonder that already in 1826, two years after the first performance, some reviewers described the finale as a festival of hatred towards all that can be called human joy. With gigantic strength, the perilous horde emerges, tearing hearts asunder and darkening the divine spark of gods with noisy, monstrous mocking. Beethoven's Ninth is thus full of what Nicholas Cook called unconsummated symbols, elements which are in excess of the global meaning of the work or of the movement in which they occur, which do not fit this meaning, although it is not clear what additional meaning they bring. Cook lists the funeral march at bar 513 of the first movement, the abrupt ending of the second movement, the military tones in the third movement, the so-called horror fanfares, the Turkish march, and many other moments in the fourth movement. All these elements vibrate with an implied significance that overflows the musical scenario. It is not simply that their meaning should be uncovered through attentive interpretation. The very relationship between texture and meaning is inverted here. If the predominant musical scenario seems to set to music a clear pre-established meaning, the celebration of joy, universal brotherhood, here the meaning is not given in advance, but seems to float in some kind of virtual indeterminacy. It is as if we know that there is, or rather has to be, some meaning, without ever being able to establish what this meaning is. What then is the solution? The only radical solution is to shift the entire perspective and to render problematic the first part of the fourth movement. Things do not really go wrong only at bar 331 with the entrance of the Marcia Turca. They go wrong from the very start. One should accept that there is something of an insipid sham in the ode so that the chaos that enters after bar 331 is a kind of return of the repressed, a symptom of what was wrong from the very beginning. What if we have domesticated the ode to joy too much? What if we have got all too used to it as a symbol of joyful brotherhood? What if we should confront it anew, reject in it what is false? Many of today's listeners cannot be struck by the empty, pompous character and pretentiousness of the ode, by its somewhat ridiculous solemnity. Recall what we see if we watch his performance on television. Fat, self-satisfied, well-dressed singers with bulging veins making a great effort, accompanied by a ridiculous waving of hands, to get their sublime message through as loudly as possible. What if these listeners are simply right? What if the true obscenity is what takes place before the Marcia Turca, not after it? What if we displace the entire perspective and perceive the Marcia as a return to everyday normality? that cuts short the display of preposterous portentousness and thus brings us back to earth, as if it were saying, you want to celebrate the brotherhood of men. Here it is then, real humanity. And does the same not hold for Europe today? After inviting millions from the highest to the lowest, the worm, to embrace, the second strophe ominously ends, but he who cannot rejoice let him steal weeping away. The irony of Beethoven's Ode to Joy as the unofficial European anthem is, of course, that the main cause of today's crisis of the Union is precisely Turkey. According to most of the polls, one of the reasons motivating those who voted no in the last referendums in France and Netherlands was their opposition to Turkish membership. The no can be grounded in rightist populist terms, no to the Turkish threat to our culture, no to Turkish cheap immigrant labour. Or, in liberal multiculturalist terms, Turkey should not be allowed in because, in its treatment of the Kurds, it does not display sufficient respect for human rights. And the opposite view, the yes, is as false as Beethoven's final candentha. 
the case of contemporary Turkey is crucial for a proper understanding of capitalist globalization. The political proponent of globalization is the ruling moderate Islamist party of the Prime Minister Erdogan. It is the ferociously nationalist and secular Kemalists who, focused on the fully sovereign nation-state, resist full integration into the global space, and also have misgivings about Turkey joining the European Union, while the Islamists find it easy to combine their religious cultural identity with economic globalization. Insisting on one's particular cultural identity is no obstacle to globalization. The true obstacle is the transcultural nation-state universalism. So, should Turkey be allowed into the Union? Or should it be let to steal itself weeping out of the Union? Bund. Can Europe survive the Turkish march? And, as in the finale of Beethoven's Ninth, what if the true problem is not Turkey, but the basic melody itself? The song of European unity as it is played to us by the Brussels post-political technocratic elite. What we need is a totally new melody, a new definition of Europe itself. The problem of Turkey, the perplexity of the European Union as to what to do about Turkey, is not about Turkey as such, but a confusion about what Europe itself is. What then is Europe's predicament today? Europe is caught between the great pincers of America on the one side and China on the other. America and China, seen metaphysically, are both the same. The identical hopeless frenzy of unchained technology and of the rootless organization of the average man. When the farthest corner of the globe has been conquered technically and can be exploited economically. When any incident you like, in any place you like, at any time you like, becomes accessible as fast as you like, when, through TV live coverage, you can simultaneously experience a battle in the Iraqi desert and an opera performance in Beijing, when, in a global digital network, time is nothing but speed, instantaneity, and simultaneity, when a winner in a reality TV show counts as the great man of the people, then, yes, still looming like a spectre over all this uproar are the questions... What is it for? Where are we going? What is to be done? There is thus a need amongst us Europeans for what Heidegger called Aussein Andersetzung, interpretive confrontation, with others as well as with Europe's own past in its totality, from its ancient and Judeo-Christian roots to the recently deceased welfare state idea. Europe is today split between the so-called Anglo-Saxon model, accept modernization, adaption to the rules of the new global order, and the Franco-German model, save as much as possible of the old European welfare state. Although opposed, these two options are two sides of the same coin, and our true path is not to return to any idealized form of the past, for these models are clearly exhausted nor to convince Europeans that if we are to survive as a world power, we should accommodate ourselves as fast as possible to recent trends of globalization. Nor should we be tempted by what is arguably the worst option, the search for a creative synthesis between European traditions and globalization, with the aim of constructing something one is tempted to call globalization with a European face. Every crisis is in itself a stimulus for a new beginning. Every collapse of short-term strategic and pragmatic measures for the financial reorganization of the Union, etc. A blessing in disguise. An opportunity to rethink its very foundations. What we need is a retrieval through repetition. Wiederholung. Through a critical confrontation with the entire European tradition. One should repeat the question, what is Europe? Or rather, what does it mean for us to be Europeans, and thus formulate a new beginning? The task is difficult. It compels us to take the great risk of stepping into the unknown, yet its only alternative is slow decay. The gradual transformation of Europe into what Greece was for the mature Roman Empire, a destination for nostalgic cultural tourism, with no effective relevance. The conflict on Europe is usually portrayed as one between Eurocentric Christian hardliners 
and liberal multiculturalists who want to open the doors of the European Union much more widely to Turkey and beyond. What if this conflict is the wrong one? What if cases like Poland should compel us to narrow entry, to redefine Europe in such a way that it would exclude Polish Christian fundamentalism? Maybe it is time to apply to Poland the same criteria as to Turkey. The high-class mazurka should make us no less suspicious than the low-class Turkish march. The lesson is thus clear. Fundamentalist populism is filling in the void of the absence of a leftist dream. Donald Rumsfeld's infamous statement about the old and the new Europe is acquiring a new unexpected actuality. The contours are emerging of the new Europe, of the majority of post-communist countries, Poland, the Baltic countries, Romania, Hungary, with their Christian populist fundamentalism, belated anti-communism, xenophobia and homophobia, and so on. A further point apropos of which we should risk the hypothesis that Heidegger was right, although not in the sense he meant it, is what if democracy is not the answer to this predicament? In his notes towards definition of culture, the great conservative T.S. Eliot remarked that there are moments when the only choice is the one between sectarianism and non-belief, when the only way to keep a religion alive is to engage in a sectarian split from its main body. This is our only chance today. Only by means of a sectarian split from the standard European legacy, by cutting ourselves off from the decaying corpse of old Europe, can we keep the renewed European legacy alive? Such a split should render problematic the very premises that we tend to accept as our destiny, as non-negotiable facts of our predicament. The phenomenon usually designated as the global new world order and the need, through modernization to accommodate ourselves to it. To put it bluntly, if the emerging new world order is the irrefragable framework for all of us, then Europe is lost. So the only solution for Europe is to take the risk and break this spell of destiny. Nothing should be accepted as inviolable in this new refoundation. Neither the need for economic modernization nor the most sacred liberal and democratic fetishes. So although the French and Dutch know is not sustained by a coherent and detailed alternative vision, it at least clears the space for it opening up a void which demands to be filled in with new projects, in contrast to the pro-constitution stance which effectively precludes thinking, presenting us with an administrative political fait accompli. The message of the French no to all of us who care about Europe is no, anonymous experts whose merchandise is sold to us in brightly coloured liberal multiculturalist packages will not prevent us from thinking. It is time for us, citizens of Europe, to become aware that we have to make a properly political decision about what we want. No enlightened administrator will do the job for us.